on what uh, it's now. Hello, and welcome to this session of Innovate for Climate 2022. I'm Lindsay Larson, an economist in the Agriculture and Food Global Practice at the World Bank, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's discussion on how accelerator programs can catalyze private investment in climate smart agriculture. This conference is focused on how we reach a climate smart future, and we can't do that without engaging the agriculture sector. Data shows that up to a quarter of global emissions, a quarter, are caused by agricultural activities. And yet only 3% of climate finance goes to the sector. So we desperately need more financing and better approaches to transition agriculture to a sustainable path. And it's a particularly challenging problem because the key agents of change here are 500 million poor smallholder farmers across the globe many of whom lack the incentives or financing to adopt new practices. I'm really excited about the discussion we're going to have today because our speakers are going to be talking about an example of what works, specifically how accelerator programs encourage impact investors to target climate smart agriculture and introduce a model that can be tailored to meet the needs of farmers and investors in any context. We want to do three things with the audience today. First, understand better how science-based evidence and agricultural research can really drive investments into climate smart agriculture. We also want to provide some guidance on how development practitioners can verify and partner with agribusinesses to increase access to private or blended finance. And then, as I said, we're going to present an accelerator model that meets the needs of farmers, agribusiness, and impact investors to reach sustainable and profitable outcomes. And maybe if we could pull up the slides now, great. I want to note that this session is jointly sponsored by ICRA, IWMI, and the World Bank. And on behalf of the bank, we're, we're happy to be participating in this session today. Uh, next slide, please. To get a sense of our audience today, we invite you to participate in an online poll with three questions and we'll drop the poll link and questions into the chat and reveal the results at the end of the session. We also want to invite you to engage on social media and to share questions for our panelists via the chat and we'll curate and queue up those questions for the second half of the program. Our first speaker today, Dr. Inga Jacobs-Mata, will introduce the ICRA Zambia Accelerator, starting with a short video, and then walk us through the key components of this accelerator program. Then we will have a panel of speakers join who will talk about these components in more detail. Inga, please take the floor, thank you. In my local language, we say welcome, and it's called Mwaisi. This is the amount of investment money out there that's waiting to be invested, and it's not coming into the places we need. I'm super happy with the Icra Zambia team, which is taking such a private sector approach. You and SME working in the agribusiness ecosystem. The objective of the Icra initiative we are launching today resonates very well with the mission of the New Dawn government. So excited and delighted to be here today. And uh, uh, for those of you who weren't in our virtual dialogue, we had a matchmaking dialogue today, where so many SMEs came together and from all over Zambia, really trying to connect partnerships to apply for this accelerator grant that we're launching today. So wonderful week so far, uh, lots of partner meetings, um, but really, uh, the work now needs to get done, and so that's that's what we're looking forward to doing with you. And I know some.
We want to move in some systemic change here in Zambia and we have to do it in partnership. So a lot of what we're doing is scaling work that has already been done for many years. The one where we support gender-based violence survivors, the network of women who live in HIV, where also we support women that are living in HIV, and as well as the women that are with the disabilities. We have a really, really good community now of potential agribusinesses, so let's make the best of it, and uh, yeah. Great, great. Um, so that was just a little snippet uh, of, of what we have started in, in Zambia with our accelerator, our ICRA Zambia accelerator program. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Inga Jacobs Mata. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, and I'm delighted to share a very brief overview of, of this uh, accelerator program and, and really with the idea of also sort of um, uh, starting a discussion on, on how we can uh, best move forward where we're sort of in the, uh, in the, the mid, uh, midway um, of, of implementation at the moment. Uh, thank you. The, the next slide, please. Now, maybe just uh, before I get into things, uh, ICRA, as, as Lindsay mentioned, is a World Bank funded uh, project. Uh, it is currently being implemented in six African countries, uh, three in West Africa and three in East and Southern Africa. And it is really, it's a scaling project. So it's about scaling the impact of uh, CGIR's climate research in Africa uh, with, the, with the focus on climate smart agriculture, scaling climate smart agriculture, as well as enhancing the delivery of climate information services. Uh, and, and one of the, uh, the, the, the central pillars uh, that you can see on the, the left-hand side um, uh, focusing on knowledge generation, but also how we do, how we how we achieve scale in partnership, um, and then how we also uh, support the, the the uptake of of these innovations um, by by different uh, users. Now, a, a particular focus, uh, well, for for this session, we we're really talking about uh, the the. The work in Zambia, uh, so one of the the six uh, countries, and um, and and particularly around how we we focusing on uh, private sector uh, partnerships through this through this accelerator grant uh, mechanism. What what we are trying to do in in Zambia is apart from the the, the accelerator grant, there are also several other um, activities that we uh, where we try to support the agri business ecosystem, such as a private sector facing internship program where um, learners or, or students are placed in SMEs to work on very real challenges that um, that these organizations um, or companies face. Uh, in addition to that, we have also um, set up a multi-stakeholder dialogue platform. And really that's a, it's a learning and an engagement platform for very different stakeholders to get together and discuss what these issues are at, at the interface of climate smart agriculture and climate information services. And then in addition to that, we also train intermediaries to communicate climate services at scale through various trainings and workshops. We have several webinars targeted at women and youth owned uh, businesses specifically. And then at the end of the day, also trying to identify what are these uh, financing mechanisms um, to, to de-risk private sector investments in, um, in, in, in food value chains. Thank you, the next slide. Uh, so, so a little bit about um, how we've set up this accelerator. We, we, it was really quite a, a participatory process where we co-designed and um, co-validated uh, these what we call bundles. So they are really um, 
combinations, mixes of climate smart agriculture practices and climate information services bundled into these, these four bundles um, with an additional grant that really looked at the best in class uh, for, for women empowerment um, and as well as youth empowerment, so, so socially inclusion. The bundles uh, included a, a um, off-grid solar irrigation bundle, an integrated aquaculture agriculture uh, bundle, a third bundle looking at drought tolerant seeds, and then a fourth bundle really looking at integrated uh, agriculture and, and livestock. Thank you. The next slide. And, and as I said, you know, the process has been quite uh, participatory. We, we started with several uh, information sessions with SMEs and actually some of our, our partners on the call that will join the panel uh, helped facilitate uh, this, this engagement with a huge cohort of, of SMEs um, in, in our beginning phase in the design of these, these bundles. We then realized that um, in, in Zambia particularly, there was a need for uh, partnership support. And, and so we ran a series of, of matchmaking dialogues to help SMEs find, uh, find partners um, where they could apply uh, uh, for, for, for the accelerator grant. And then um, in phase three, uh, there was a, a call for, for applications. And of course, the, the call had a very specific criteria. It, it, um, applications needed to be a consortia of a consortium of, of partners to address one of these, these bundles, and they had to demonstrate their scaling strategy to do so. And so now we are so happy, as you saw in the, the uh, video, we have now onboarded our agribusinesses. 14 agribusinesses have been onboarded in these uh, five bundles. Thank you. The next slide. Inga, just a note, we have about 30 seconds left. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the, the offer, uh, as we, we have it at the moment, is a combination of both a scaling grant as well as technical assistance. And you can put the next slide, please. And specifically on the, the grant, it is about how we reach these 300 beneficiaries in Zambia in the next two years with a 50,000 US dollar um, seed or scaling grant, um, each bundle of partnerships having to reach 75,000 uh, farmers. So you can see it's quite an ambitious ask, um, but many of these bundles or partnerships have already demonstrated how they could, um, or, or, yeah, how they, how they reach uh, these beneficiaries in, in the different domains. Thank you. The next slide. And this is just one of the examples, uh, uh, specifically for bundle one, where we have a solar pump uh, provider, uh, as well as a microfinance organization, uh, Lupia, and you will actually uh, hear from them in a minute. Um, and, and then a digital uh, technology component uh, through an agribusiness called Lima Links that provide market information uh, to, to subscribers. Uh, and, and through this way, we, we, we hope that we will be able to reach these, these many, many um, uh, farmers. Uh, thank you. The next slide. Lastly, I think, I think we can just go through this one in the interest of time. Thank you, Reese. Um, and, and then just to conclude, you know, uh, what we've also found was the need to, to complement the, the, the scaling grant with uh, technical assistance that helps, helps these um, accelerator partners um, uh, in, in terms of capacity development and implementation um, of uh, climate smart agriculture, commercial and investment readiness, really supporting them to increase commercial capacity of the portfolio and and be investment ready. And then finally, impact investment, uh, sorry, impact measurement, how, how we measure uh, climate smart ag metrics to, to quantify the impact of, of uh, these different interventions. Um, I will stop there in the interest of time, Lindsay, but I'm sure we can take it forward in the panel discussion. Thanks so much and back to you. Thank you, Inga, for that quick overview. We are now joined by several panelists who offer rich experience, many with this particular accelerator program. I'd like to begin by inviting Mercy Zulu-Hume 
to open the discussion. Mercy is a sustainable finance expert working with the CGIAR. And Mercy, a perennial problem we hear about matching impact investors with viable projects is lack of information or the right type of quality data. And investors typically are not familiar with organizations like the CG family. So can you talk a little bit about why agriculture research for development is key to driving sustainable finance? And what role can the CGIAR and key partners play in making science-based evidence readily available? Thanks. Thanks, Lindsay, and, and good morning, good evening, um, afternoon, everybody. I think we can all agree that agriculture is important and we know why it's such an important sector. And yet, um, according to British International Investment, uh, formerly called the CDC Group, there's a funding gap in Africa's food and agriculture uh, industry of as much as $31 billion annually. Uh, and further to this, um, Brighter Bridges, which is a research and intelligence firm, one of my favorite publications, um, reported that of an estimated 4.9 billion uh, US dollars in, in venture funding that came to, Afri to the African continent in 2021, only 4% went to um, agriculture startups and SMEs. And the trend has been similar in previous years. So why, um, while the agriculture sector you know, has been receiving donor funding, um, this is not enough. There needs to be involvement from the private sector to close this gap. Uh, and it begs the question, why does such an important sector struggle to raise the required uh, financing for sustainable food production? Because one thing is a constant, we all need to eat. So the commercial viability is, is clearly not the problem. So I want to just touch on a couple of reasons um, for this and, and then, you know, tied into where agriculture research for development comes in and, and research institutions like the CGIAR. Um, the first is the sector specific risks associated with primary production, such as climate related risks. Um, investors, financial institutions and other financiers have challenges in assessing risk um, before investment and managing that risk uh, post investment. So the risk assessment um, is really about enabling the financier to assess the likelihood or probability of an adverse event affecting their investment and therefore their return. So it's a key part of the investment process. Um, the second challenge is their high transaction costs associated with the agricultural uh, sector and agricultural investments in particular, because of the nature of these type of deals compared to, you know, the small ticket sizes or invested capital. So an investor is looking at, I'm spending all this money, uh, expenses on assessing this deal, but I'm putting less into that deal and I'm, you know, in terms of returns, it doesn't, uh, the calculate, the, 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 the math doesn't work out, so it's not attractive. And, um, the third challenge is the mismatch between investment needs of farmers and producing companies and different pools of capital coming in. So you have development finance institutions, you have banks, you have pension funds, insurance capitals. How do you get those large amounts of funding down to the farmer level? Um, so all these challenges just lead to you know, insufficient pipeline of bankable businesses. Now, there are solutions to these challenges that you know, agriculture research for development and in particular the CG is strongly positioned to provide. And I'll break this down into buckets. Um, what research institutions are doing on the supply side and then the demand side. Um, and, and on the supply side, um, you know, um, and I'll use the CG as a, as a case study here is, you know, we developed lots of robust but easy to use science-based risk assessment tools for pre-investment that can help investors identify climate-related risks and potential areas for value creation post-investment so that they can make better investment decisions. Um, these tools are used in combination or can be used in combination with uh, the usual financial and social inclusion screening te techniques to help an investment officer prioritize high impact, high growth companies for, for investment. And the assessment tools also identify, you know, potential areas of technical assistance and management um, that a company would need post investment. So in this way, investors have the capacity to manage risk, you know, to increase their returns while contributing to food system resilience and sustainability. Um, in, in summary, these type of tools and frameworks developed by research organizations play a really important role in, in lowering the transaction costs for investors and improving the risk assessment, managing risk, maximizing returns and, and, and impact at the same time. Finally, um, in addressing the sector risk question and identifying best mechanisms to, to channel capital down to the farmers, and Inga briefly touched on this, um, blended finance is one such approach 
Um, it can help de-risk some of the financial industry and the private sector challenges, but you know, it requires a multi-stakeholder partnership approach that includes uh, research, uh, 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 research institutions. And one such example is um, a collaboration that we've done uh, with uh, an impact investor called Responsibility, where uh, Responsibility launched a 200 million blended finance um, uh, a fund to co a, a, a fund for a climate smart food system, so food systems, and we helped co-design that fund, integrating both science-based food systems approach um, into the investment um, strategy. So um, when we look at the demand side of things, we've spoken. I've spoken a lot about the supply. On the demand side of things, uh, where the conversation will be focused today, a key role for research institutions is around climate smart agriculture technical assistance and, and impact measurement and management technical assistance, um, which can also be useful to the supply side. And Inga also touched on that briefly in, in her presentation. Um, research institutions have the knowledge and expertise to support agribusinesses uh, with that TA support that enables production efficiency while facilitating adoption uh, of climate smart uh, strategies. And this could be anything from upstream, you know, production, how to increase yields, manage soil, water, energy efficiency, input efficiency, um, traceability, everything along the value chain, um, that kind of technical support and knowledge um, um, it, 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 uh, comes from these type of research institutions. Um, so in summary, thanks, Lindsay, I can see you there. In summary, there's a big role for agriculture research and development in de-risking the sector to catalyze finance, and, and this through co-developing tools, framework, investment vehicles, approaches that make financiers more comfortable in investing, but also in helping de-risk the companies themselves through technical assistance that can be provided in accelerated programs such as the ICRA Zambia Accelerator Program. So I'll hand over um, uh, back to you. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Mercy. That was a really comprehensive but but quick answer to my question. And I think it's clear the role of, of research in driving investment into this area. Now, let's shift to the farmer perspective. And for that, I'm going to call on Evelyn Kayingo, who is the founder and CEO of a firm called Lupia. Evelyn, can you expand more on why farmers need financing to scale innovations and the lens that your company in particular is taking to address it? Thanks. Okay, so thank you so much for that introduction. And um, I mean, it's already a loaded question, but I feel like uh, Messi answered uh, all the questions and um, just here, you know, just giving my contribution at the end of the day. But um, I mean, typically uh, on the ground, uh, as a financing uh, institution, um, one of the key things that uh, farmers are always going to uh, speak out to us is just simply not having access to capital, uh, which they technically need. And if you look at the changing environment now uh, uh, on the continent, uh, the economy is changing, climate is changing. And so all these erratic uh, weather patterns and uh, farmers being able to really uh, produce yields that are sustainable throughout the year. and um, just a lot of those challenges that they face, uh, which really at the end of the day, really just boil down to them having access to capital to be, to be able to alleviate uh, some of these problems. And so we see that uh, a lot of uh, smart capital is gonna be required now uh, more than ever, just because of the conditions that farmers are faced with now. Uh, a lot of uh, pipeline uh, 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 financing models are really gonna be very important to be channeled against, uh, or rather to, uh, fa uh, to farmers uh, today. Um, typically, um, you'd see that um, uh, financing uh, from uh, institutions like us need to really cater for very flexible uh, weather patterns, uh, very flexible season uh, seasonal farming. Uh, a lot of small scale uh, farmers typically uh, finance uh, or rather grow their crops uh, through seasoned uh, uh, rain fed farming, but farmers need to now technically have access to financing to actually uh, uh, acquire uh, uh, smart technologies to be able to find themselves uh, doing pottery engineering, uh, to be able to engage in um, a lot of um, uh, solar smart irrigation uh, farming, uh, that will really cater for them to be able to grow throughout the year and be able to uh, have productive yields, uh, efficient uh, ways of farming. And the only way we can start to do that uh, as uh, institutions like ourselves is to really start to look at the farmer uh, in a way we've really advanced on consumer financing and be able to tailor long-term uh, financing uh, models for farmers. Uh, to be able to cater for these demands. Um, a lot of what we're seeing now is that it's very competitive to be a farmer. Uh, they have to be very productive. They have to produce efficiently. 
uh, they have to uh, be able to uh, harvest on time, uh, harvest uh, large yields to be able to meet uh, market demands. Uh, at the same time, be able to um, really just manage uh, their financing and build that uh, sort of pipeline that will help them uh, in, uh, in their growth. And so what we are also just restructuring uh, as an institution is to start to look at alternative data because their data is not there to really uh, finance a farmer. And so we have just deployed a lot of uh, machine learning, learning models to be able to uh, provide uh, alternative uh, data and provide alternative financing, which we have focused on as an institution. And so it's just very exciting now in the market to see a lot of climate financing coming on board. Uh, being a private institution, typically uh, financing um, for uh, smart climate, uh, uh, for smart climate uh, farming is really something that's very rare. Uh, it comes with very stringent uh, requirements, which basically in turn, uh, we pass those on, on to uh, the farmers. And at the end of the day, we can either provide the access or they can't even uh, really just qualify for uh, the, the capital that they actually need. So it's very exciting times to see now. And I think the really major problem uh, that uh, fa uh, farmers need to actually uh, combat is access to capital. And it really has to be smart uh, finance, which basically will allow uh, for flexibility and longer uh, timelines and tenures to be able uh, to facilitate and uh, really have productive yields. Wonderful. Thanks for those initial comments. And to pick up on the issue of access to capital, I think we know that that's a struggle for SMEs as well, that who are uh, various agribusinesses supporting farmers. And this particular accelerator, many accelerators bring together several key actors and SMEs or small and medium enterprises can be a critical bridge for access to farmers new techniques, more sustainable inputs, and increasing financial literacy for SMEs is critical to access the capital to make that transition to sustainable practices themselves. Um, I want to ask Jean-Frédéric Beauchene to pick up on this and talk a little bit about how financial literacy can be increased in countries like Zambia and elsewhere. And Jean-Frédéric is the chief of party for the EDGE Zambia partnership with the International Water Management Institute. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much, Lindsay. Um, yeah, definitely. This is a great question. Um, and it's actually, it goes beyond financial literacy. Um, as an example, Edge works with uh, 450 SMEs. We have 370 at the moment, um, scattered across three provinces, across six value chains. When we selected our SMEs, we assumed that the uh, level of capacity was a little bit bigger than we, uh, than we had imagined. And uh, unfortunately, but fortunately for us as a project, there's an opportunity to cover a lot more bases than just financial literacy. It is primordial, yes, but there's other issues around business planning, uh, simple business acumen, looking at the ability of uh, businesses who are interested in financing, let alone climate financing, uh, to be able to better propose um, their vision, put thought down to paper around you know, well-constructed business plans. And you know, even just creating networks, we were finding that uh, SMEs have a lot of really good ideas to, to move their business forward and even get into some CSA practices, but even the, the networks are not that well established. So where Edge comes in with its many partners, some around the table, like Open Capital Advisors, uh, and some of the bundle partners of ICRA is that we have a bit of a single window hub and spoke approach where literacy, yes, is, uh, is looked at through business advisors. We have about 18 technical experts and business advisors on the project. We leverage from universities. We're just about to launch a big ICRA ME uh, internship program that should bring around 36 interns. Uh, to work with SMEs, some on research related to CSA, but in other areas such as financial lit, uh, basic bookkeeping, and so on, to cover some of the fundamentals to be able to move eventually to access to finance. Um, the partnership model of EDGE is actually really contagious and, and I would say infectious. Uh, we started to work with ICRA about 14 months ago. A lot of our SMEs were bundle recipients, and a lot of our SMEs are now being shared, if you want, amongst like-minded projects. So we're tackling many aspects of a business development pathway to finance, both with our own resources, but a lot of it is leveraged. So to be successful in, in targeting the SME, um, let's say conundrum that we're facing in Zambia is that partners really have to come together and not be quite territorial. 
Um, it's not just about financial lit. It's about inputs, access to right input output supply network, who's got access to certain technology, who's able to get consignments for certain irrigation capacities or to scale solar, uh, which partners provide uh, potential mini grids to certain aggregators or processors to be able to um, improve their practices. The, the, the menu has been really incredible. We're now tapping into research expertise that we didn't have on a project through academic partners that we're gonna join forces with to build SME capacity, but to also build a culture of CSA. We're tapping into service providers within our market system. You know, we're moving away from a value chain, very linear approach to programming where it's not just about the seed provider, the, the producers, and the processors and the end buyers. It's about all the intermediate services that can come in within the market system around organics, liquid fertilizer, certified seed, erosion prevention technology. It's also about getting the right access to finance partners in place. Open Capital will be able to speak to some of those we're working with. But we currently have seven commercial banks and all of them at a recent workshop that we held were very much committed to having CSA at the front end of their new products. So we're currently looking at agriculture related products, irrigation related products, where a menu of different options could be made available to the smallholders uh, on a pay as you go basis or around CSA asset based financing. So we're finding that the space to be able to build SME capacities is really, really broad and it's a wonderful playing field. And with, uh, with ICRA's internship program, I think you'll see a lot of really important fundamentals being addressed. But by bringing other partners, we're going to be able to hit the SMEs along multiple streams of capacities. So we look so much uh, forward to working with Lupia on the call, uh, you know, <laughs> working with OCA even more and certainly open up the doors to, to have the SMEs become uh, very much catalytic and in, in increasing not only their profits and revenue, but creating a, a very strong uh, CSA investment uh, climate for everybody else. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those shots, uh, thoughts, Jean Frederic. Okay, finally, I want to wrap up the panel discussion with the investor perspective shared by Martin Slawick, who is a principal at Open Capital Advisors. Martin, given what we've discussed today, can you talk more about how we can attract more investment in climate smart agriculture at this scale? Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Lindsay and Iker, of course, for their broader support and facilitating this panel. Uh, I think it's a very relevant question. I think, you know, Inga, Mercy, Evelyn, and, and JF have all touched uh, upon this question in, in different ways because it, it, it is addressed uh, by different kind of channels and, and opportunities and interventions across the entire ecosystem. Um, but more broadly, as many of us know, you know, the climate agenda, including climate smart agriculture, has become front and center and is only becoming more and more urgent. And you know, that's included a, a renewed influx of, of funder and investor interest across the capital spectrum, everything from, you know, philanthropic capital to impact capital and commercial capital, really looking to fund and support interventions that can help smallholder farmers and rural economies both mitigate and adapt to climate change. And obviously, there's many ways to, you know, attract and invest investment in, in CSA. Um, but a few that I've seen be particularly impactful and, and needed for investor engagement across the broader continent of Africa, but then also more particularly in, in Southern Africa. You know, one of those is investing in, in multi-stakeholder partnerships, uh, and ICRA has already done that in Zambia. And so, you know, the issue that comes with climate challenges and ultimately how they affect farmers are so much bigger than one actor can own. And especially when we're talking about usually subnational level interventions, you know, coordination between the government, businesses, and the funders and investors is, is really, really critical. And that means taking the time to, you know, dialogue about, you know, what is really needed in local communities and how climate change is specifically causing droughts, flooding, pests, ETC, and then identifying what can be done about it so the money goes really where, where it's needed. Second is, you know, leveraging blended finance to mobilize capital. And, and that means through different innovative structures like investment funds and facilities that combine, you know, impact capital to, to crowd in more private sector investment. Um, there's also guarantees and technical assistance grants, um, but also things like accelerator programs and, and, and TA efforts with donor funding that can help organize and strengthen the broader market ecosystem uh, that could, you know, encourage the, the, the success of CSA inter interventions. And third is also supporting 
CSA agribusinesses become more investment ready. And through either embedded support in accelerator programs or sidecar technical assistance facilities, there is a need you know, for coordination between the businesses deploying CSI, CSA solutions, and the investors and financiers. And what we often see is that the businesses have you know, a, a big opportunity to increase impact and have these innovative solutions, but do need help with things around you know, pre-investment support, like developing their business model, their financials, their investor documentation, really to be able to, to, to go to market and, and be attractive to, to raise capital, whether it's you know, softer uh, or, or harder capital. Um, it's also helping funders and investors understand the diverse set of CSA opportunities with different impact and risk return expectations and leveraging platforms um, like accelerator programs to facilitate that, that, that matchmaking. I think ICRA and, and Edge are, are really phenomenal examples of, of, of that and making a big impact in a market like Zambia, where there's so many innovations and new, new models being designed to help farmers and, and value chains that need support. You know, some are you know, big tech platforms, some are just adaptations on traditional processes and helping you know, to match some of those partners to uh, you know, different uh, funders, donors, investors, you know, through those platforms, market studies or pipeline exercises can really kind of move the needle in terms of, you know, how many of those are visible and ultimately get funded. And again, there's such a wide spectrum of those opportunities that many of, you know, the other panelists have, you know, articulated by the, you know, input technology for drought resistant seeds. There's, you know, tailored production practices like regenerative agriculture and agroforestry, which is becoming, you know, quite, quite hot for funders and investors. And we've seen several investment funds and facilities around the world and in Africa being created for, for carbon offsetting, but at the same time, giving smaller farmers an opportunity to plant trees for longer term profit, while at the same time, you know, introducing intercropping uh, for short term cash flow. And even that example does link back to kind of leveraging blended finance, where these facilities will use things like donor capital or first loss guarantee mechanisms, all to enable, you know, other private sector actors or DFIs you know, to invest at a volume that is needed, but at the same time, providing that space for that capital to be patient, right? And that example, obviously, trees can take, you know, upwards of, of, of 10 plus years to, to, to mature and, and, and pay off for, for farmers. Um, there's obviously all the kind of innovations around, you know, post-harvest, you know, processing and distribution technology. I know JF mentioned, you know, so, solar power and, and things you know, that are enabled by, by that technology around irrigation, cold storage. And a lot of that is, is leveraging the great momentum that we've seen in the off-grid uh, energy sector and having it transferred over to, to, to agriculture has been really impactful. And, and where there is quite a bit, a, a lot of bit of interest in funding, you know, those kind of technology and, and, and hard assets, right? So seeing a lot of activity there. I think lastly is also support services and, and systems. So things like index-based weather insurance, uh, to help de-risk that the cash flow for the farmers in, in the instance of adverse weather events, uh, GIS and data collection monitoring to help farmers know when, where, and how to plant better. Again, that's just kind of a, a subset of all the different opportunities for for investors to participate. But the, the point there is, you know, trying to to exhibit that deep pipeline and trying to match, you know, different uh, you know businesses and agribusinesses at different points in their growth to the right funder or investor that that makes sense, right? As ICRA does, there, there's some instances where those businesses need, um, you know, some some grant capital um, to get them started and get the, the idea going, and others that obviously are, are are looking to scale to another three countries regionally or across the continent and and need a very different type of, of capital base. Um, and then lastly, I think as as JF mentioned, and, and that's where you know uh, someone uh, you know such as the Edge program has been very successful in supporting the Zambia market is engaging. Uh, a different set of funders and 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 really investors, which is looking at local capital providers, right? And and thinking about you know uh, local MFIs, commercial banks that all have balance sheet um, to invest in these agribusinesses and helping them identify ways to support those that are really moving the needle in terms of you know climate smart solutions and helping businesses integrate those uh, into, into their uh, daily operations. I think to to wrap up, I mean overall there is a significant amount. Of increased funding uh, to climate smart agriculture that has you know you know gone into the the space in the, in the last few years. I think there is only a need for that to increase, um, and really encourage those uh, with the capital to closely work with different stakeholders in the CSA ecosystem to identify those opportunities and and help those interventions grow and scale. Great, thank, thank you. you very much, Martin. And as you 
noted in various ways, there's a lot of movement and innovation and all kinds of actors who are bringing capital forward to try to address the CSA transition that's so needed. So I'd like to do just a quick fire round robin with a question to really the essence of this session today, which is what works and lessons learned that we can take from this accelerator program, but also others. And to Martin's point, there are a lot of similar types of accelerators, other kinds of platforms that are trying to offer not just financing, but bringing different stakeholders to the table to provide technical assistance and um, other types of training and, and support. So maybe I'd invite all of you to, to just very, very briefly come in with a minute or two of any other examples you've seen where this is working well and why that's the case. Would anyone like to kick us off? I, I can give it a shot. I mean, there's just so many examples on the EDGE program. Um, mm. One of the things that that's actually worked well is it's not about necessarily who you bring to the table, but how. Um, there's been a, a tendency to look at, um, let's say, putting an SME in an access to finance pathway by simply looking at the SME in a specific product that a bank has to offer, for example. But again, I think, as I mentioned earlier, for many of the SMEs that we work with, and probably the same ones that Lupia does, we're, we're a lucky project in that we're dealing with the like non-bankable small SMEs. So there's many steps in the process from registration to records to financial literacy to networks and markets and contracts that need to be addressed. So there's not one solution. And we found that, you know, it's, it's about getting the right partner at the table. We're recently talking to a group called AMSCO and they provide embeds. So we have an objective to build middle management capacity. We can't do it the way that our program is configured. So we tap into that partner to be able to, in a pre-vetted, pre-screened way, put an SME in the middle and say, look, we all are working with this SME, right? So who can come in on the microfinance front? Is it going to be Lupia? Yes, and for what? What does that person have as a business plan? Okay, it's not quite ready. We can do it with our business advisors who can then come up on the inclusion side for development of policies. Perhaps it's a group called NGOCC with a gender lens. What else does the SME need? Okay, it's needing a niche market. Okay, we provide a training, but where's that market? Where is the tier A or large business that potentially can bring the soft taker on a formalized contract? So then it's really about creating a mini ecosystem and a work plan approach to having the SME as the forefront. And then over time, you can longitudinally say, okay, we know where the business is today. We know where they want to go. We know they need these service providers, these inputs, that TE, that extension work. And then each project is able to then pick within their resources and kind of accompany the business. I call it clustered accompaniment. I'm actually hoping it's going to be a term that's going to catch and we're going to coin it. But, um, you know, it's, and I think that's the way to go. It's really about putting the SME in the middle, which really falls well into this government's, you know, new deal and, and the, the way that SMEs are really the center of attention. And then the banks are becoming much more receptive because they can see all sorts of partners de-risking. We're not providing guarantees, although Edge did recently, uh, with the help of uh, OCA as well, help one of our banks get a 20 million guarantee scheme. But that's only one type of de-risking. The de-risking happens with multiple hands coming together and then in enjoying an accompaniment process that was so traditionally not the space. People just fought for their own indicators, mandates, and results, but now we're sharing results. And I think this is uh, the, the model to go. Thank you. Great. What was that? Acc accompaniment, uh, uh, you heard it there first. <laughs> What was, what was the term you had coined? Uh, I just call it clustered accompaniment. Cluster accompaniment. Okay, great. <laughs> A new model. Evelyn, it looks like you wanted to come in with an example too. Yeah, I mean, I was just coming to comment great. and say, I mean, like age as well, we've really been able to just uh, get that validation as a private uh, organization as well and looking to really uh, put a mass market uh, product and really provide for this segment. And so uh, looking at the fact that we've bundled together with uh, Lima Links and Vitalite to really provide uh, sustainable financing for uh, solar irrigation pumps uh, for farmers. And 
what really just brings up validation for us as an online company is to be able to partner with Lima Links and look at all this big data uh, where we can actually find transaction history for the farmers. We can actually uh, locate their locations and see what they're actually doing. And so just being able for our data team to put that information together and say, this is an actual uh, an, an actually a good um, sustainable financing and agricultural product for Lupia, which is actually the first, just gives us this, uh, this really glorified uh, final uh, validation moment for us uh, on how we actually get into a market and be able to really target a really large segment. And while we are looking at 75, we, we, 75,000 farmers, uh, we've just really been building a use case and saying, why not 1 million farmers? And so we've just been very aggressive, uh, really trying to make sure that we do save uh, a demographic that actually needs this type of products. Uh, we've always said, there's, um, I mean, Financial, financing has always really been built for um, uh, institutions or individuals or businesses that are really modeled like a Western uh, product. But finally, we can say we have products that actually look like uh, the individuals that live on these continents that actually go through this sort of day-to-day uh, uh, -day challenges and transactions. And the truth is that we can't find them anywhere. And really being able to get in a partnership like this and still be able to operate in a model like ours and just partner with other uh, organizations like Limalings, Vitalite. And I'm looking forward to uh, having discussions with Edge and seeing how we can just really get together and uh, really foster uh, a lot of financial inclusion and uh, smart financing products uh, for the market. So it's just very exciting for us. Great model. Anyone else want to come in quickly in about a minute's time to share an example? Uh, Lindsay, if I can maybe just add a quick thing, it's really uh, encouraging to to hear the the, the partners' views. Um, uh, and I think you know, for for administrators of of uh, accelerator programs or support programs like this, yeah, putting putting the SME first, as as JF said, is is really important. And and looking at the ecosystem, um, I mean, there are challenges, you know, with with small ticket sizes like this. Um, risk-free as it may be, uh, you know, uh, SMEs struggle with the with the administrative burden because they, you know, you still have that, and um, and so finding, you know, ways to support, uh, but also be able to to deploy, you know, ticket sizes like this is is an interesting challenge, um, and and uh, yeah, you know. Uh, Finding finding ways to also get the different partners to work together, as as JF mentioned, is something. Um, where we're moving to now is is developing metrics, you know, for as I said, for for how we measure the impact of climate smart ag and CIS scaling. Um, that's that's an interesting one. I mean, I'd, I'd also just to everybody joining the call, it would be really interesting to hear from others. You know, if they have any ideas around how uh, sort of how we measure um, uh, these kind of things, hearing different examples also always helps us. So uh, yeah, just to share that. Thanks, thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Inga. Okay, I'd like to thank all of the panelists and speakers today, and offer a few notes of reflection as we wrap up. So I just want to summarize quickly what we've heard today. First, why are we here? We recognize that agriculture is a key sector for investment to realize a sustainable future, but we're faced with funding gaps, particularly for farmers seeking capital, as we heard from several speakers, and accelerators are one way to meet that need by improving access to finance. And beyond grants, we heard that accelerator programs can offer unique technical assistance to improve access to data and uh, science-based um, evidence. Uh, they can prepare organizations, small companies to absorb investment, manage investment, and then as Inga noted, um, work towards actually measuring impact. And we spoke today about ICRA, which works to make climate information services and CSA more accessible to smallholder farmers across Africa. We heard that it's a model that works because it's truly multi-stakeholder and very collaborative in its approach. And this type of approach is appealing and needed to investors because it helps to reduce risk, it can lower transaction costs, and ultimately then increase returns. And finally, I want to conclude by saying that this approach and others really must keep farmers and SMEs at 
the heart of the approach if we want these types of CSA practices to be truly sustainable and, and long-term in their implementation. So again, thank you so much for joining. Please feel free to reach out to myself or any of the other panelists in follow-up and we'd be happy to learn more about your experiences or share information about this particular case study. Thank you very much.